It's not the lies that you tell in public, but the truth that comes out behind closed doors. And you now have the evidence before you of what was going on behind the doors at 23 Felter Lane. The state doesn't always get that lucky. We rarely get videos of actual homicides. That, that makes sense. People don't usually commit murder on camera. And we rarely get this sort of evidence that gives you an insight into the moments leading up. Minutes, three and a half to four minutes before murder, and immediately following. But you have that evidence in this case, and it gives you a sense of what was going on inside that home. And we all know that people are their most genuine, their most true selves, in the comfort of their own homes, and certainly in the comfort of their bedroom. And that is the real Keith Johansson. The Keith Johansson you saw talk to detectives for hours, that's not the real Keith Johansson. He went into that room and for hours and hours he lied to law enforcement. He thought, apparently, that he could shoot and kill his wife, go to the sheriff's office, paint a pretty picture of this awesome, beautiful marriage and an accident that he staged and the Flagler County Sheriff's Office would just ask a few questions and let him go. Apparently that's what he thought. He even asked a few times, why am I even here? Your wife was just shot and killed in your master bedroom, and you're questioning why you're even there. Why haven't I gone yet? He asked the woman that brought him into the room, and he asked Sergeant Horace later, why am I even here? Ladies and gentlemen, he thought the sheriff's office wouldn't care. They would take the accident, and they would not care, just like Keith Johansson. The Keith Johansson you saw talk to his parents for hours. Lie, 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 and lie again to his father, who clearly was not buying this story. He believed this accidental shooting was nonsense. The father and the mother are giving him options. They're, they're proposing other things. Keith, if it was anything else, if she snapped, if you snapped. Not only was he not the real Keith Johansson with him in the room when he was being recorded, but for 20 days after, when there's no law enforcement around. His parents were open to what the truth was, but he wasn't being truthful because that's not him. This is the real Keith Johansson. And now, even after three years, the Keith Johansson that took the stand before you yesterday is not the real Keith Johansson. That is the real Keith Johansson. The man who took the stand before you yesterday has had more than three years to review autopsy reports, police reports, body cam video, Arlo, cam Arlo video. And earlier in 2021, hire someone to help him and tell a story. Which we'll talk about. Objection. May approach the bench. It is very rare to have an objection lodged during closing arguments. It's usually a sign of respect toward opposing counsel to avoid objections, if at all possible. What could they be saying to the judge at sidebar? Let me bring in our special guests on the program, Marsha Minot and Josh Schiffer. Marsha, to you first, please. Any guesses as to what defense counsel's arguing? Yes, it's probably arguing that it's too close to his invocation of his right to have counsel, and that would be a violation of his constitutional rights to have the jurors use that against him. A great point, Marsha. Thank you. Josh, anything you want to add to Marsha's point, please? No, I think Marsha really nailed it there, you're, and you're absolutely right. You really give a lot of deference to your opposition uh, in front of the jury when it's uh, openings and closings because you want the jury to respect you. Uh, in the same way. 
So this really is a little bit of a hiccup. It is an interruption of a process that's generally really smooth and composed. Uh, obviously, they're having quite a discussion at the bench. And it's interesting uh, when you're actually in court, what you can hear and not hear. Oop, here they come. Josh and Marsha, thank you very much. And so some three years into this case, he tells Buffington, his expert, what happened. And we're going to go through what he told him here today, what he just testified to. But even so, when you, when you saw what he told Buffington in early 2021, the man that took the stand yesterday, Keith Johansson, changed and modified that even further because now after sitting through trial this week, and hearing it all fleshed out before him, mm, those law enforcement officers were pretty clear I wasn't wet. So even though I took a shower, I took a shower, I took a shower, he told Buffington he took a shower. Matter of fact, he took a whole shower and was changing. When his wife came into the bedroom, that's what he told Buffington yesterday. What did he tell you? Well, I just like put a foot in. I didn't really get to get in the shower. And I heard her say boo. All this time to know what the evidence is against him. And for him, Mr. Johansson, to develop a story to tell you and ask you to believe in relation to self-defense. That same evidence that gives you this insight into their home is what you will consider part of it um, for your consideration of premeditation in this case. And I've taken some of those videos, which were longer and some of them hard to catch all of the um, phrases, and I've clipped them out for you. So I want to go through some of those now. A statement of Mr. Johansson. I'm going to... See you again. Change anything, Judge? No. Okay. Just one side. Why is it playing? The next one was, you can have all my guns because I will probably do something bad with him. If you remember on cross yesterday, Mr. Johansson only remembered the first part of that statement. He was just offering Brandy his guns. He didn't remember that he said this. You can have all my guns because I'm going to do something bad with him. I've got to get away from you or I'm going to kill you. I have to get away from you or I'm going to kill you. I've got to hurt you or have someone else hurt you because God knows you deserve it. Hurt you or have somebody else hurt you because God knows you This one was, I know, hard to hear originally. Are you afraid, Brandy? Are you afraid yet? Because you're going to be. I'll cut your fingers off. Are you afraid, Brandy? 
And if you remember yesterday on cross-examination, I asked him if you guys had ever talked about killing each other or suggesting she should kill herself, and he denied that. He asked, or he suggested that she use this gun. He's going to leave it there to haunt her, and maybe just someday she'll do that. And of course, after he removes the camera at the end of the night of the 5th, as he puts it in the living room, as is walking back into her bedroom, he says, I'm going to beat your ass. And so you obviously have all of that evidence of the circumstances surrounding this murder. I want to talk again about the defendant's testimony in detail from yesterday, and I want to start with the reasons why he told you that he lied. What were those reasons? Number one, he said he had to lie and lie and lie and lie because he didn't want to tell anybody about their meth usage. Their meth usage. There wasn't even meth in the house. He wasn't even, according to Mr. Johansson, he wasn't even facing charges. He risked the truth coming out about a shooting, being able to assert self-defense, and providing investigators all of that information with embarrassment? Does that make any sense? No. And then, of course, the second one, he even admitted on stand that he had already done that. He, he testified on direct, well, I didn't want to expose our marital problems. Well, clearly he did that in his interview with the detectives. So that makes no sense. And perhaps the most insulting reason of all of them, he didn't want to tarnish his wife's name. That man in those videos was worried about tarnishing his wife's reputation. Not only that, but that same man who said that as, I, I wouldn't want to tarnish her name as I am such a good person. But yet, he will falsely try to blame a neighbor, plant that seed with law enforcement. He brought up a neighbor that was snooping in his yard in his interview, and then when Detective Quinteri went back out to meet him some days later, she told you that he asked her if she would look into this neighbor. And she said, is there anything else? Well, there's this one neighbor. You should look into him. And then again later on the phone to his mother, suggesting a six-year-old that Ryland could have shot and killed his mom. His reasons are not genuine. They're not genuine at all. And what did he say happened yesterday when he testified before you? Again, he said, now, yesterday, I didn't really get in the shower. I put a foot in, and I heard her say boo. What did he tell Dr. Buffington? What did he tell Buffington? He was in the shower. He took a full shower. She came around the curtain, played peekaboo, and they left. And then he got out and got dressed. It's a completely different story. But yesterday, he told you that he went to get in the shower. His wife said boo, a term of endearment, would call his attention to go out into the bedroom. And when he did, he saw her on the side of the bed with a Beretta, conveniently the one weapon he knows doesn't have less than lethal, so he had to what? Leech for a gun because she's threatening him and telling him he's made of plastic. The same woman you've seen 
four minutes prior to this, acting completely normal on camera, interacting with people that come to her front door, talking about her plans with her child that day, and had texted her sister at 10.15 about those plans. That woman, three and a half minutes later, called him plastic. So then when he describes the incident, he gets a gun, he goes towards her, yelling commands at her to drop it. And I'm not sure I kept up with his story correctly, but I believe he said that the woman, his wife, Brandy, took the gun and swung it at him. But he said she got close enough and she actually hit me. And so I asked him, you were close enough to her? You could have touched her, taken the gun, pushed her? Now, he doesn't have an obligation to do that under true self-defense and a threat of your life, but this is your wife, this woman that you love, who you're so shocked. She's going through delusions. Did you, did you try to push her? Did you do anything? I wouldn't want to push her. No, no you just killed her. Does that make any sense, ladies and gentlemen? Any sense? She was four foot 10, 90 pounds. And he wants you to believe, he didn't want to push her, that he had to use self-defense in order to save his life. He had to shoot her twice. Does that make any sense? What else did he say? Well, yesterday he said that they had been awake for 10 to 12 days. He told Buffington seven to eight. He talked about the last time they did drugs. He testified yesterday that he had not really seen Brandy that morning. I think he said he passed her in the hall when he went to get his jeans. But yet he told Buffington that she was acting irrational and emotional. You remember from the testimony, but there were two words he used to describe her that morning to Buffington. It's different. And then again, we have the rest of his testimony we just talked about. You have to ask yourself, is what Mr. Johansson said consistent with the medical evidence in this case? You have that. You have videos and you have medical evidence. You heard from Dr. Bulick in this case. And what did Dr. Bulick testify about as far as the shots? When Dr. Bulick testified about the contact shot in her chest, he said that that type of wound although not lethal in this case, would have been very, very painful. Our skin carries a very large amount of pain receptors, that it would knock someone down, it would um, knock them off their feet, disarm them, that's what it's intended to do. But yet when Mr. Johansson took the stand yesterday and testified, he testified that after she got hit with that chest shot, I said, what happened, did she fall? No, she just, she flinched. And then that's when apparently she reaches back and cocks the gun to come at him again. Ladies and gentlemen, four of a ten, 90 pounds. And he wants you to believe that that shot, that wound, made her flinch. Made her flinch. Now today, you heard from the defense expert, Buffington. Mr. Buffington. And I asked him about his degrees, and I in no way was trying to disparage pharmacists. He has a pharmacy degree, absolutely. But he introduced himself as a doctor. He introduced himself as a doctor. And so I was just trying to point out what exactly his degree was so you could understand the credentials of him and compare those to the credentials of Dr. Goldberger. And what did, what did he essentially tell you? He told you a lot about the effects of these two different drugs. And absolutely, Dr. Goldberger said, sure, all of those things that Buffington listed can happen, right? It can happen with a certain amount of usage of both meth and marijuana. But the question in this case is not, can they happen? Because they're using that evidence to corroborate what Mr. Johansson wants you to believe, the delusions that she said I was plastic, that she clearly was having some sort of psychotic break. So what's important is, did it actually happen? Does the evidence support that that would have happened, what Mr. Johansson is saying? And Buffington said, 
Even Buffington said, yeah, her meth levels were low. They're therapeutic if it was a prescribed medication. And Dr. Goldberger said, they are low. I've seen 10, 20 times higher levels. And what did Dr. Bulick tell you as well? That the sort of psychotic symptoms that Johansson told you his wife was exhibiting would occur more so in the 200 and up nanograms per milliliter, not 47. And so Buffington came before you. He talked about the side effects of both of those drugs, the possible ones. Sure. What did he not tell you on direct? He didn't talk about the other information he had from Mr. Johansson. But I got up and asked him about that. And that's when I pointed out the difference in the story that Mr. Johansson told you yesterday and that he told Buffington in February to March. His report was written in March of this year. So just before that, when he met with him. In March of this year, he took a full shower. He was getting dressed in his room. Brainy entered the bedroom, presumably from the hallway, got a gun, said those things. That was about the only thing that was the same, that he was plastic. And then, then what? He shot her once. He just shot her. No mention of two shots, no mention of a struggle, no mention of any of that that he testified to yesterday. He didn't tell that to Buffington earlier this year. And then obviously Dr. Goldberger, what does he do? Not only does he look at the toxicology, which just gives you that glimpse, that sort of time of death moment of what those numbers mean, but he looks beyond that. He looks to the other evidence in the case. Videos. In this case, we have proof that cannot be argued with, at least the existence of what's on those videos. We're clearly arguing what they mean and show with the videos. And he said, three to four minutes before she dies, well, even not, you go back to 10 or 4, 10 in the morning, you've got a whole half hour of clips. She's walking, talking, interacting with her son, with people at the door, people we would all perhaps turn away. She's polite. She runs after a cat. She has a glass of coffee or a mug of coffee. And then she walks back to her bed never to be seen alive again. So Dr. Goldberger looks at all of that. It wouldn't be responsible of him to just rely on toxicology and come in here and just say what's possible. What matters for this case is how you apply it to Brandy and then compare that to what Mr. Johansson says she was acting like that morning. Again, it's what he Told Buffington. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go through some of the law. You just heard the jury instructions given to you by the judge. But I want to take a few minutes and go back through some of those instructions and touch on them. There's three elements that the state has to prove in this case beyond a reasonable doubt that Brandy is dead, that it was caused by the criminal act of the defendant, and that it was a premeditated killing in order for you to render a verdict of first degree murder. And so what is premeditation? We talked about this in jury selection, and Mr. Lewis told you that it might not be what you kind of walked in the courtroom thinking it was, like a lot of law and order and um, daylight crimes, the ones that make for great television, a lot of times have, you know, months long plots and murders for hire and a lot of things with like a super um, heightened level of premeditation. But this is what the law requires. Just like Mr. Lewis said, that it's just killing after consciously deciding to do so. And the important thing is that the law doesn't affix an exact amount of time. The law doesn't tell you it has to be more than 15 minutes, it has to be more than 30 minutes, days, or hours. It doesn't say that. And it's a question that is determined by you from the circumstances of the killing and the conduct of the accused. So I want to go through some of those. And we've already gone through them, and I'm just going to put them up here. But it's things we've been talking about. What are the circumstances? Well, we know from the videos and from April 5th, 
the intent, the desire, and the threats to kill her on April 5th. We know that there was a shot at close, or excuse me, contact range, indicating that's a personal shot. Holding a muzzle of a gun up to a human being is an intent to scare, frighten, and kill. And then the second shot in this case, as we know, would have had to be a purposeful act. The trigger has to be depressed again. And those are the circumstances of this killing. And then what about the conduct of the accused? That's something you can take into an account in this case. The defendant, if you look at those scene photos, and I know you did, you will, about the perfectly placed firearms, you know, he didn't do a good job. He placed them at her feet where they would have fallen in an accident with a holster right there. Forgot about that holster. It's real close to that can, where it came from. Some water thrown on the master bedroom floor, because we now know he didn't take a shower, right? So he clearly was trying to stage water on the floor, stage scene, accidental. I'm going to put two guns here, because he knows she's shot twice. So he was trying to come up with something that looked plausible. And most importantly, he doesn't offer life-saving measures to his wife. Brandy, that's important. He's immediately worried for himself. He's cleaning up drugs in his house. And he lies, and he lies, and he lies. And he changes up what have happened. It was accidental. Maybe the neighbor did it. Maybe Ryland did it. Nope, it's self-defense. And so those are the things you can consider with all the other evidence as to how you come to your decision and premeditation in this case. Something else that you, will, you were told and that you will also consider in relation to the defendant's testimony is how you weigh that. And these are some of the factors. And clearly, you need to look at Mr. Johansson and ask, was he honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? I'm not sure if you noticed yesterday, but every time I would ask him certain questions, sometimes his response was things like, if that's what you think, or maybe, or it wasn't a yes or no when it was a yes or no question. Did you lie about this? Did you lie about that? Um, and he would try to get out of it. And then I would ask him again, affirmatively, and he would, he would admit the lie. He wasn't even, even though he was coming in to tell you he was lying, he wasn't even willing to admit the lies as I asked. So he was not being straightforward. And of course, he has the biggest interest in this case. That's just the facts. He's the defendant. And obviously, we've gone through how his testimony does not agree with other testimony and evidence in this case. And you can rely on your own conclusion about him or any other witness. You can choose to believe part or none of any witness's testimony in this case, and that includes Mr. Johansson. We, um, we may never know what happened on the morning of April 7th that brought those threats, that desire, that intent to kill back up. It could have been anything. Unfortunately, there's almost four minutes of time that's not covered by video. But it could have been anything. He could have caught Brandy masturbating. Brandy could have gone back there and brought up the infidelity and tried to apologize. She could have gone in and told him, I'm going to the fair today. I'm getting out of here. I'm taking Ryland. It could have been anything. They approach the bench. All right, so another objection. This makes two now in the state's closing argument. And I said this before, I'll say it again. It is very rare to see objections 
during closing arguments, it's something that is known among lawyers that you you hold off on unless you unless you must you must make that object or objection for your record. Um, and, and here we see the the basis being articulated at sidebar. So we don't know exactly what defense counsel uh, is saying to the judge. But let's see if our guest on the program today wants to venture a guess. We have Josh Schiffer standing by in Atlanta. Uh, Josh, any idea what do you think he might be saying to the judge? You know, I really think that it's a follow up conversation because I believe very commonly a judge is going to caution or warn or, you know, make a statement at a bench conference, but not actually rule. It's a warning shot or a shot across the bow. And then I, it's common if there needs to be enforcement for someone to stand up and say, all right, judge, let's go deal with this now. And I think that's what just happened there. Uh, we'll see how she responds right here. Josh, thank you. Again, ladies and gentlemen, we, we will never know. We don't know. But there's several things in there, in that bedroom, that could have happened. Something that set Mr. Johansson off and something clearly did. And I'm going to show you a few more clips of some of those statements in the days before that shows his intent and shows you what he thought of his wife. Person, either be or kill you because you're a whore. I heard That's what he thought of her. And in the moments after he killed her, those are important too. I was just talking about everything that led up to, but in the moments after that you have on video, what did he do? What does he say on 911 first? He says, I need an officer. I was in the shower and starts to explain. What does he say when Deputy uh, Paritis comes through the front door? I was in the shower as he heads back. There's no screaming for help. There's no applying pressure. There's no, oh my God, she's dying, get here. This is where the blood is. There's none of that. There's none of that. If a, if a shooting happens in a house like this under these circumstances between two spouses that's accidental, if it was suicidal, or if it was someone forced to make a tough choice like Mr. Johansson wants you to believe, a horrible choice to shoot his delusional wife to save himself, what would he do immediately after? He would go to her aid after he had to protect himself to save his life, he would still go to her aid. That's what a reasonable person would do. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. He called 911. He cleaned up marijuana. And he refused to touch her or offer help. And like I open, we've all heard of the saying that you never know what happens behind closed doors. You never know what people are dealing with. But now we know. We know what Brandy Salenza was dealing with. She was dealing with this man who wanted to kill her and killed her on April 7th. And all of the evidence in this case supports that he did so, and he did it premeditatively. And at the end of this case, we will ask you to render a verdict of guilty of first-degree murder because that's what the evidence supports. Thank you.